Hello, Max Cohen here with some AP US history. Let's jump in. Today we'll be looking at a few case studies which touch upon a concept that stems from World War II all the way to the present day. How has America's preeminent global influence shifted the moral boundary of armed conflict? It is a favorite topic of mine because we get the opportunity to study an art school dropout with a funny mustache. No, not the Lee, nor Chaplin, nor even America's number one fan, Borat. You've probably guessed it, Hitler. Don't they look weird without their mustaches? We'll also look at the law school dropout and stamp collector FDR. No judgment if you didn't guess that one. So why is this topic relevant today? In the last Republican debate, Dr. Carson said, We've, we've gotten into this, this mindset of fighting politically correct wars. There is no such thing as a politically correct war. While these candidates do not represent the entire U.S., Americans undoubtedly continue to debate America's job in global affairs and the rules and values that frame how we get that job done. It was after World War II, and the U.S.'s defeat not over monarchy, but fascism, which sealed the deal for American preeminence. While a long time ago, this preeminence, however, came at a cost, a great cost. Americans and their enemies had gone places in the name of victory, which seemed quite morally suspect. Where did they push the moral envelope? As the pictures scroll across the screen, try to identify them by name and associate them with one significant person or organization before they go off screen. I'll do one with you. Japanese internment camps created by FDR. Now, you try two more on your own. Here we go. We use the four quadrant dock analysis technique we learned last week, looking at each quadrant separately, we notice the source of the picture in the third quadrant, California State Library, helping me to identify this as a Japanese internment camp, a topic you should have already studied. As review, let's recall how Japanese Americans needed to adjust to a contemporary six and a half dollar diet. Imagine the worst school cafeteria food you've ever forced down. Got it? Okay, now make it into sushi. Hot dog and spam sushi was a reality. Yum. Let's continue with the two other Stanford Reading Like a Historian document skills, close reading and corroboration. If we look closely at the faces of the Japanese, we notice that many of them are smiling, an almost creepy expression considering our knowledge about the camps. As historians of U.S. history, this should make you question the authenticity of the picture, making us suspicious of government propaganda. This is especially true if you corroborate the document with this image of the Holocaust, where these prisoners, albeit under much harsher conditions, display sullen faces of despair. If internment camps were cultural death camps, concentration camps were physical death camps. Hitler blamed the Jews and several additional millions of those he deemed undesirable for Germany's misfortune, exterminating them, experimenting on them, or working them to death. It's heavy stuff, and it continues, sadly, for both sides of the war. With Hitler defeated in Europe, FDR's replacement, President Truman, had to decide how to force the stubborn Japanese leadership into surrender. Some think that the bomb was justified, others are not so convinced. Please pause the video if you need a review of this key U.S. history debate topic. Regardless of whomever was right or wrong regarding the bomb, if such a thing is possible, it's doubtful that the question was at the forefront of the minds of mourners at the recent 70-year reunions. As we will see moving forward, it often seems for the survivors of tragedy less about whether or not to forgive, but how not to forget. So how did we rebuild ourselves morally? Was such possible after so many dead? The lost generation of writers surely found it difficult after World War I. Firstly, the UDOHR was signed as part of the UN's formation. And no Tolkien fans, it was not named after some place called Udor in Middle Earth, as awesome as that would be. Instead, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promised international protection of John Locke's three inalienable rights, life, liberty, security. The Founding Fathers replaced security for the pursuit of happiness. More on that in another time. This declaration brings us to the Nuremberg Trials, where 23 political and military leaders of the Third Reich were accused of committing crimes against humanity. Americans were still left wondering, how could ostensibly moral human beings commit such morally suspect actions? Some answers emerged from American psychologists in the coming decades, one being Stanley Milgram and his obedience experiment. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called sharks harmless. You're going to get a shot. 
180 volts. I'm not going to kill that man there. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility for anything that happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right. Hitler once said, you must submit to the overwhelming need to obey. Because someone else is willing to take responsibility for his actions, that participant, the seemingly moral and intelligent human being, was convinced to give patently lethal doses of electricity. Sadly, he wasn't the only one. 65% of participants gave the learner triple X danger shocks. Shocking indeed. In a second study at Stanford, psychologist Philip Zimbardo created a fake prison experiment with randomly chosen prison guards and fake arrested prisoners. It wasn't long before a randomized situation saw prisoners placed in solitary confinement, hosed down with fire extinguishers, and mentally breaking down to the point of delirium. Prisoner 819 said that he couldn't leave because he had to prove that he wasn't a bad prisoner. With props and the right environment, otherwise sociable guards had become creatively cruel. Prisoners outrageously self-victimizing. These two American studies help us to explain how the atrocities of World War II could have occurred. But does it excuse? If normal people were able to do these things, does it make the morally questionable actions of World War II less outrageous, more plausible, less extreme, and more forgivable? Or does it actually make it less forgivable, as they weren't necessarily the actions of the mentally ill or the deranged, but those of socialized human beings expected to uphold basic moral standards. This brings us to Argentina. Yes, Argentina. Not because it's a bastion of the mentally ill or anything, but seriously. It's a place with a rich cultural history, from famous authors like Jorge Borges to soccer magician Lionel Messi. Unfortunately, it was also home to a whole lot of Nazis. Our last case study for today focuses on Adolf Eichmann, Nazi colonel and lead organizer behind the final solution, the plan to exterminate all the Jews. As you might be able to guess from the menorah in the picture, Eichmann's trial took place in Israel some 16 years after the Nuremberg trials. He'd been hiding in Argentina until Israel, against international law, extradited him. A particular note for us is Eichmann's facial expression during the trial. As he was called to the stand to face charges of crimes against humanity and throughout the trial, he behaved like he was aloof of the magnitude of the situation, embodying the not-so-intelligent guy who just did what was asked of him. Hannah Arendt was a German-American political theorist who has written extensively on Eichmann, coining the phrase, the banality of evil. This is how she puts it. The trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were, and still are, terribly and terrifyingly normal. From the viewpoint of our legal institutions and of our moral standards of judgment, this normality was much more terrifying than all the atrocities put together. This brings the psychology experiments outside the lab and back to history, reminding us why the atrocities of World War II were so terrifying. The vast majority of those who were executing their country's plans were seemingly normal, bland, banal people. It's this evil which Arendt is describing and we need to come to grips with going forward in American policy. I've collected a few short quotes from Arendt and famous psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, which might help us jumpstart our brainstorming. One group I've called Ironies, the Other Justifications. Let's look at the first set together. Pause the video and read the first one on your own. It is difficult to compare evils and dangerous to transplant moral values or concepts from one time period to another. This is known as anachronism. Think the Flintstones, but with morality. Nevertheless, this first quote does not convince me to excuse Eichmann, because if we are going to let the fear of hypocrisy stand in our way of preventing evil in the world today, we might as well tie our hands behind our backs permanently. However, if we do hold people such as Eichmann responsible for their actions, we also better be ready to answer for the skeletons in our own closet. Just as Ghana in this example better be ready to answer for their forced capture and sale of American slaves in the first place. Please pause the video and respond to the rest of the quotes in this grouping by explaining which quote most convincingly excuses Eichmann or those like him from being held responsible for their actions. If none are convincing, please explain why by addressing each quote briefly, just as I did for the first quote. Then restart the video and do the same exercise for the grouping entitled Justifications. You got this. Is it easy to spin our wheels with such questions of morality? So let's end on a little lighter note. Yesterday, I was filling up some gas when I saw a woman pushing a car which seemed to be out of gas. 
I helped out, and afterwards really felt great. Such actions are the bane of boring actions of everyday people, but they are seen as really charitable, heroic deeds, not because they are done by heroes, or because they are so outrageously amazing. It's rather because of the fact that they are done by everyday people. The power of banality works both ways. It can make the newspaper-worthy hero and the villain who is just following orders. Ironically, the Israelis captured Eichmann by luring him into a trap, which anticipated he would help them with their fake broken-down car. So good people, keep pushing those cars. This has been Max Cohen, sharing some ironies of 8 history. See you next time.